In this short video, we're going to talk about how you can get a norm from a general inner product. So remember that we talked about inner products because the dot product was so useful in measuring lengths and angles. And we'd like to be able to do that in vector spaces where the vectors themselves are more general objects like functions or matrices. So why would we want to do that? Well, there's this field called approximation theory, and we may be interested in approximating a possibly complicated function with a much simpler function like a polynomial. And we'd like, to, of course, to have that polynomial be a good fit. Now, here you have a, a graph, but uh, and it looks like, at least on the interval, say from 1 to 3, that the polynomial is a good fit for this particular function, but we'd like to actually have a measurement and measure how close is it? What does distance mean when you're talking about functions? Uh, another case is um, when you're solving really large problems uh, involving eigenvalues or linear systems, uh, you can generate a basis for a subspace, which is very useful using something called orthogonal polynomial. What does it mean for two polynomials to be orthogonal? And I'll give you a hint. It has nothing to do with their graphs or tangent lines. It has to do with the inner product that you define. <clears throat> and finally, if you have a spring mass system, and you know here's the simple spring mass system that yeah, you will see in a basic physics class or a differential equations class. But a spring mass system could be really anything that flexes. So it could be as complicated as a building or a, a vehicle, an aircraft, a satellite, or <clears throat> your cell phone. All of those could be considered spring mass systems. And so you're, you'd like to analyze those. Uh, we know that we can have eigen function, I mean eigen vectors. Well, if you're looking in a vector space where the vectors are functions, you get eigenfunctions. And it's useful to keep those orthogonal with respect to the mass matrix. And again, what does orthogonal mean? How can you have it orthogonal with respect to mass? Well, we defined or could define the length of a vector in Euclidean space using the dot product. It was just the square root of the dot product of the vector with itself. Well, we can easily extend that to general inner product spaces. If we have an inner product, uh, it's got the positivity uh, property. And so we could just say that the norm or length of a vector v in a general inner product space is going to be the square root of the inner product of the vector v with itself. So let's look at a simple example before we talk about the properties of this induced norm. So we're going to use the weighted dot product on R2. The weights are going to be 1 fourth and 1 ninth. And we're going to try to measure then the norm of the vector with components 2, comma, 3. So we can go ahead, remember the norm is going to be the square root of the inner product of that vector with itself. And so I'll go ahead and put the 2 comma 3 in the place of u1 and also in the place of v1 and v2. And uh, I get that the length of that vector in that inner product space is radical 2. Let's look at another example. We're going to try to find what does it mean to say the length of a polynomial. So again, it has nothing to do with its arc length when you look at its graph. No, it's going to depend on the inner product. And here we're going to use this evaluation inner product on P2, where we say that inner product of P with Q is the values of P and Q at negative 1, 0, and 1. And then you take the dot product of those values. So we're going to find the length or norm of the polynomial x squared minus 2x. So p of x equals x squared minus 2x. 
And remember, the norm is the square root of the inner product of p with itself. So in our definition, both p and q are going to be the same polynomial, x squared minus 2. So I need to find the values of this p at the given x values, negative 1, 0, and 1. And then take the dot product of those values with themselves. And then take the square root. So I took the dot product. I'm going to get 9 plus 0 plus 1. Take the square root. You get radical 10. All right, let's find the norm of the sine x function using this norm induced by the in integral inner product. And so here again, both f and g are going to be sine of x because remember that the norm is the square root of the inner product with itself. So uh, save a little writing instead of writing a square root sign all the time. Uh, we're going to evaluate this integral um, of sine squared of x. That will not be the norm until we take the square root. So that's actually the square of the norm. Remember the square of the norm is the inner product of a vector with itself. So let's go ahead and use an identity to evaluate this integral. We find that the value of the integral is going to be pi over 2, but that integral represents the square of the norm of the sine function. So take the square root of both sides, and we'll find that the length of sine of x in this inner product space is radical pi over 2. Well, now we can talk about a general unit vector. We can say that if the norm of a vector in a general inner product space is 1, we'll call that a unit vector. And the set of all unit vectors in an inner product space is what we call the unit sphere or the unit ball. So let's take a look at a simple example where we can actually draw a picture of it. It's kind of hard to draw a picture of the unit sphere in a function space or a polynomial space, but if you're in R2 with a weighted dot product, this is the same weighted dot product that we used in our previous example, then you might be able to actually draw a picture of what the unit sphere would look like. So how do we do that? Well, we just take a generic vector with components x and y, and then we enforce that the norm of that generic vector has to equal 1. So I go ahead and put x and y in the place, uh, x goes in the place of u1 and v1, y goes in the place of u2 and v2. That's how I get 1 fourth x squared plus 1 ninth y squared. And then, of course, I have to take the square root. And I'm going to make that equal 1 because it's the unit ball. So we're setting that equal to 1. And then I can square both sides, and I get this equation, which should be familiar. x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. That is an ellipse. So in this inner product space, or with this inner product, you could say that the unit sphere, or the unit circle, because it's 2D, is actually an ellipse. So some properties of the induced norm. Of course, you would expect that the uh, norm of any non-zero vector is positive, and the norm of the zero vector should be zero. And then if you multiply a vector times a scalar and then take its norm, and remember here the dot means just regular scalar multiplication, uh, you can factor that out, but you have to uh, take the absolute value. And that can be really useful uh, when you're trying to avoid working with really large numbers or maybe other complications. All right, so now we're going to take a few slides and we're going to look at a very important inequality, uh, not only in linear algebra, but functional analysis and other fields of mathematics. And so bear with me. It's really not that difficult. We're going to simplify it by assuming we have two unit vectors. So both u and v have norm 1. And if I square the both sides, remember that the uh, norm is the square root of the inner product of u with itself. So 
that would give me that the inner product of u with u is 1 and the inner product with the v of v with v is also 1. And now I can say, well, certainly, if I uh, take the difference between those two vectors and uh, find its norm, then that can't be negative. So it's got to be greater than or equal to 0, which means the square has got to be greater than or equal to 0, which means the inner product of u minus v with itself has to be greater than or equal to 0. And now I can use the properties of the inner product, uh, which essentially amounts to a uh, extended distributive property or kind of a foil type operation and I can expand that left hand side and then I can rearrange the terms Oops. And rearrange the terms so then I'll have two inner product u with v is less than or equal to the inner product with u plus the inner product of v with v so uh, I know that the inner product of u with u is going to be 1. The inner product of v with v is also 1 because they are unit vectors. So for unit vectors, I can do a little arithmetic here. Add the 1 plus 1, divide both sides by 2, and get the inequality. That tells me that for any two unit vectors, their inner product has got to be less than or equal to 1. Now remember, these are different from each other. U and V are different from each other. So their inner product could be negative, positive, or zero. But we know that it can't be any bigger than one. Now we can repeat the same type of analysis that we did with the difference U minus V with the sum. The norm of U plus V, of course, has to be greater than or equal to zero and go through the same steps, and I'll come up with another inequality, which says that for unit vectors, their inner product has got to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So again, we know that the inner product of vectors can be negative, or positive, or 0. If we have unit vectors, then we know that it's got to be, it could be negative, but it can't be any more negative than negative 1. It can be positive, but no more positive than positive 1. So for two unit vectors, their inner product has to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Now we can summarize this statement by saying that the absolute value of the inner product has to be less than or equal to 1. Well, that's for unit vectors. What if you don't have unit vectors? Suppose you just have two general non-zero vectors, w and z. Well, we know that if we divide each one by the respective norm, it becomes a unit vector. So our inequality is going to be true if I take w divided by its norm, inner product z divided by its norm. Now, the norms are positive numbers, so I can factor those out in front of the uh, absolute value signs. And in fact, I could multiply both sides by the product of the norm of w and the norm of z and get this inequality here that says that for any generic non-zero vectors w and z, the inner product or the absolute value of the inner product of w and z is bounded by the norm of w times the norm of z. But if you look at this inequality written this way, not as a quotient, but uh, the way it's written there, it's going to be true not just for non-zero vectors. If either w or z or both are the zero vectors, then this inequality holds true because we have the equality part. If w is zero, then the inner product of zero with the z is zero, and the length of or norm of w would be zero. So I'd have 0 equals 0. So this inequality is true for all vectors. And it's called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And again, what it states is that the absolute value of the inner product of two vectors is less than or equal to the product of their norms. Well, this is really important because now we can say that the 
we can define an angle between general vectors, even if there's no other way to think about geometry in that particular space. Uh, we can still define angles by using this quotient, the angle between, or the cosine of the angle, between two non-zero vectors. Now these have to be non-zero vectors because it wouldn't make sense. Uh, you know, the, the angle, even in Euclidean space, the angle with the zero vectors is, is uh, not well defined. Uh, so we're dividing by their norms, so they can't be uh, the zero vector. But if they're non-zero vectors, we know that this quotient is between negative one and positive one. So we'll say that that quotient is the cosine of the angle between them. We're just defining that in a general vector space. And that allows us to say that, oh, two vectors in a general inner product space are orthogonal to each other, provided that their inner product is zero. So now we know what it means for uh, two polynomials to be orthogonal to each other, for example. They're orthogonal if their inner product is zero. Now, how are you going to define that inner product? It depends on the context. And we can define the distance as we did before as well as the norm of the difference of the vectors. Uh, so almost all of the results that we got from the dot product are going to hold true then in a general inner product space. For example, the triangle inequality and any of the identities that we had with the usual dot product will hold true in a general inner product space. For example, we have the generalized Pythagorean theorem that says that if you have two orthogonal vectors, meaning that their inner product is zero, then the uh, square of the norm of the sum of the vectors is the sum of the norm, square of the norms of each vector. So you get the a squared equals b squared plus c squared. So having orthogonal vectors is very useful for a lot of applications. And so it would be useful to have a way to construct a set of orthogonal vectors in an inner product space. And that's what we're going to do in our next section.